starting i believe we've started um welcome everyone thank you everyone for joining us uh, we're here today to just talk to some past students and industry um, experts and people in industry about their pathways to industry and how how people transition from education into industry and just a little bit about um, skills that had to be picked up along the way and diversifying and all sorts of stuff um, that helps building a successful career. So Paul Gilday is going to moderate this. So I'll hand this over to you, Paul, and uh, welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. I, look, I'd like to start by um, respectfully acknowledging the Yalak Wheelam clan of the Boon Wurrung, and I pay my respect to their elders, both past, present and emerging, because I happen to be in the city of Port Phillip. I acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to the land, which has never been ceded. And welcome you all today. Um, we've got quite a platitude of lovely people to talk to, starting with Sean Fuller, who's on my top left-hand corner, who'll raise his hand, Dominique Girard, who teaches at Box Hill, Audrey Pound, who's uh, down the bottom, who self-described as a jazz R&B soul singer, and Marlon Grundon, and one more at least to join us. Sean is an ex-student. Sean uh, and Marlon is an ex-student. Audrey, are you an ex-student or a Box Hill? Uh, no. Okay, that's okay. Not a Box Hill, no. We'll, we'll, still, we'll still talk to you. And, in fact, I'll ask you about <laughs> you and your story. What is what is the Audrey Pound story today? Well, well, I went to the VCA, so I'm an mm -hmm. ex-student of the VCA. Before it was, well, it was Melbourne Uni, but before it was like, there was a sign that said Melbourne Uni out the front. It was still VCA. Um, and I did a jazz degree um, in jazz trumpet, which uh, it will surprise no one to know was not a feasible music career, just being a jazz <laughs> trumpet player. <laughs> so then uh, I started singing and writing and had a, a couple of pop projects that did, had a modicum of a modicum of success mm -hmm. okay. and uh yeah i've done a little bit of production and stuff since then so one of the questions i would have asked along those lines is what did you add to your skill set to make yourself employable or make yourself viable within the industry and you're already saying songwriting um singing a whole bunch of other stuff whereas the first thing you concentrated on was jazz trumpet which is um if you want to talk about not getting any work, it probably would have been trombone. But nonetheless, um, are they all things? Are they all things that you that, that you added as a result? I think so. Um, I I don't know if I specifically did it all to get work at, at first, but uh, I think it's just uh, what I really started to learn as I got older is that the more you know how to do, the more things kind of start falling in in your lap. I guess. I, uh, yep. Yeah, like even even just as a session trumpet player, which is sort of like, I guess, the main thing that I've done, like knowing how to record yourself, for example, um, knowing how to write, uh, write music or learning how to write and being able to sing as well and sing well was really changed the game for me. And I started to get twice as much work doing both of those things. But I also feel like, uh, especially in the last few years, uh, knowing how to do a little bit of production and uh, do some work on your own records and uh, that sort of thing, I've really realised the more things you know how to do, the more the more people will want to work with you because you you know it's it's I I don't know it's less of a no no, chore. no. well it also yeah. puts more control into your hands doesn't it even simple things like I yeah. can go up and do my own posters or my my album cover or any of that sort of stuff uh well that's another thing I think I I didn't mention it just then but I do I started off hiring publicists and then kind of started doing all my own PR and like yeah. self managing and stuff which sometimes you don't think that you're doing but it is another no, skill and being able to do that for yourself and do it well I guess or qu quite well and building your own contacts as an artist instead of relying on paying somebody else to like it is a really big thing yeah it's a significant transition from being student to being someone we see within <laughs> industry and, I, and I'm assuming Audrey Pound is your um your moniker the thing that you go through your brand as such mm -hmm. yep and Audrey Brown represents a singer 
a trumpet player when required, but but Audrey Pound at home is manager, publicist, um, a number of a number of other duties that are related. Mm, definitely. Okay. Manager is probably the one. It's like uh, that was the hardest lesson I think when I was hitting my head against the wall, kind of worry, wondering why my music as an artist wasn't getting anywhere. And then realizing that uh, the way you approach the industry and um, yeah, there's this kind of myth around and it does happen for a very, very tiny amount of artists where everything just falls in your lap and it's all amazing. And wow, I just blew up out of nowhere. But for everyone else, there's like, you know, a team of people pushing them. Yeah. And I think once I realized even, you know, I'm working on a low, a lower level, I'm a small independent artist. But once I sort of realized that if, if you learn about those skills and you learn how the industry works, even just like if you're going to send an email to a radio station or to, I don't know, a, a venue to get a gig, what you actually say in that email. <laughs> and then I realized all the things I'd been saying that were just like, nobody needs to yeah. hear about your existential musical crisis when they're trying <laughs> to book you on a Saturday night. Yeah. yeah. But learning how to send those emails, which is management, you know, was yeah. a huge, a huge thing for me. Okay, so yeah, it's difficult. Marlon, I'm going to shift up to you. You are an ex-student and we're favouring, no, we're not favouring ex-students. <laughs> you, you, you will have existential crisis because you're a composer. Yes. And you're a bass player who became a composer. That's um, true. And you and I discussed this earlier. It's not the normal path, the general pathway. Tell us about your gig and, and how you found yourself in the position you are to, you're in today. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I was really lucky. I grew up in a super musical family. Uh, my dad was a sound recordist. He did a lot of uh, environmental sound. So sort of coming from that, I, I played bass with my brother and my dad all the time. But um, I think what really made me fall in love with composing for media was that sort of sound element um, that I sort of learned from my dad. Um, and yeah, so I, I studied at Box Hill. I did the um, Bachelor of Music Composition. Um, and then from there, I was recommended for a job uh, with a gentleman named Rob Upward, uh, who sort of is another composer in Melbourne. Um, and so I sort of came on uh, as an assistant and co-writer for him. And sort of since then, I've been working on a lot of my own projects and um, worked on a feature film, lots of different things. We would traditionally, well, I would traditionally think of composers as people who are working on feature films. But mm -hmm. you've, just, you've, you've said media. You've blanketed that whole area by, by using the word media. Yeah. What other things do you write for? Um, I mean, you know, the, the dream is obviously to, to be the, the next um, Hans, but honestly, I think the the dream for me is just to work on lots of different types of media. I, I, I've recently been working on some theatre shows, which is a completely different paradigm to working on podcasts or working on games or working on anything that has a, a, an element that's not music that then needs music is a really fun challenge to sort of work with. Okay. You also mentioned Robert, somebody, forgot his name, to apologise. Yeah, yeah. Has he been a mentor to you in this kind of thing? And yeah, so of course. How important is that? Yeah, I mean, he, he um, I was so incredibly lucky with Rob because he, he just really was uh, really supportive. He let me, you know, come into his studio whenever I wanted. He uh, recently, we worked on a TV show for Channel 10 and we co-wrote it together. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been really supportive with sort of giving me jobs and also giving me responsibility and, and teaching me how to use that responsibility. Um, but yeah, I, I think he's, he's really been instrumental in, in my ability to think of myself as not just the person who sort of uh, writes music in their bedroom to someone who actually, you know, can write music and, and, and write it in a professional sense. So that's a transitional thing for you then that he's taken you through by saying, it's not just something you love doing, this is something you could be doing for a living. Or should be doing yeah that. yeah exactly i mean he yeah it, it was a real fundamental shift that sort of happened from because i'm not i'm not i was a, i was his assistant for a, for a couple of years but now um he's made a very conscious effort of, of making me a co-writer which is is just been you know really fantastic obviously um Excellent. but yeah yeah congratulations i'm going to go boy girl boy girl which brings me to dominic gerard Gerard, Gerard. Hello, Domin. Gerard. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Dom, you, apart from the fact that you and I work together, it's um, 
you're in a band and this is a whole world for me that I don't understand. That band signed, well, I do understand it, but I'm not that familiar with it. It's signed to Mushroom. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that um, and also the work that you do at Box Hill. Yeah, sure. So uh, that, that band that I'm in is called NYCK and we were picked up by Mushroom um, must be about four years ago or five years ago maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been with them ever since, which has been a really great experience for us. And um, it kind of did just come out of nowhere, which was really awesome. Um, but it's got, to, it, it's got to come out of somewhere. Was it a performance? Did you send a tape? How did you... Yeah. So, yeah, I guess like didn't come out of nowhere, like knocking on my yeah. door. But um, I guess we uploaded one single to Triple J on Earth. Yep. And then we had the next day, like, um, Sony, uh, all major record labels basically wanting to meet. And we did meet with a few and stuff. Um, and then we ended up signing with Mushroom um, as more of a Melbourne-based semi-independent record label, I guess. Um, and they've been super nurturing and a really great thing for us to do um, that's been great to build on our careers. Um, that's led us both, it's myself and um, my friend Nick, that's led us both into different careers. I mean, um, in a professional sense, doing co-writes and, um, you know, gigs with other bands or asking to be on someone else's record, some, some of that kind of work, which has been awesome. And then also given the skill sets to create other bands and expand in different areas and different genres of music as well, which is really important. Um, yeah. Nurturing. You use the word nurturing. What does that mean in terms of a record company? How do they? How have they nurtured you? Yeah, I think. Um, first of all, I think the people that work there are really. Um, on a really similar kind of wavelength to us, I guess we really bonded with those particular people um, and they made us feel like it was that they had our back and they definitely have and that they've, you know, thrown money at the project and they've made sure we were, oh my, they sent out nurturing packs during okay. the first lockdown. like. I think we have such a great connection with the people. They're very personable. Okay. Um, and I think I definitely look to that in this kind of industry because it can be a really lonely industry mm -hmm. if you don't have people, um, you know, pushing you on and nurturing you, I yeah, guess. Absolutely. Um, this was also giving you confidence to, to move off into the other areas that you've moved off into. Mm -hmm. But I want to look at this thing. A lot of us are looking for a title, whether it be composer, whether it be front house person, whether it be guitar tech, whatever the case may be, or whether it be performer, artist, manager, whatever. Um, you do both. You're, you're an educator. Um, you're also a performer. Is there one that you feel like you have to, that comes before the other? What do you write down when you have to get off an aeroplane? They say, tell me what your job is. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I do that, I definitely say education. Mm -hmm. um, but if I... If I introduce myself, I generally say I'm first and foremost a performer okay. um, or a creative yep. um, and then an educator. That's how I definitely see myself, but equal passions for both. Okay, cool. Which brings us to Sean. Sean, welcome. Um, we Thank talked you. a little bit before, and I know that you do a lot of front of housework as in mixing bands, but, but, but your background is in production. You do the production course at Box. Yeah. Right back to 2012, 13, is it? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. Tell us about that and how that went from, particularly from being a student and then gaining the confidence to end up in the, in the areas that you end up in, that you've ended up in. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't super linear. You know, I did the course cause I was, I thought I was playing in bands and I thought, oh, I'll get a stable nine to five job thinking I could, you know, do the course and become a studio engineer and someone would just hire me, which you learn pretty quick is not the case, not to mean that you can't make a career out of it, but yeah, so I did the course. And then after that, I started, you know, doing little bits of my own sessions here and there. And I 
worked as an assistant um, for a producer named Malcolm Besley and also at Ginger Studios. And okay. so I was kind of doing that for a couple years and, you know, doing a little bit of everything like playing, you know, playing in bands and doing the studio thing and doing kind of, I don't know, little bits of live sound. But I feel like the real flip for me was, you know, I was working as the guitar tech for a friend's band who's doing a bit better than mine and the sound guy didn't come so they're like oh can you can you do the live sound and i was like of course i can <laughs> definitely couldn't like i did a real bad job but it was it ended up going okay and it was fun so i did their did their tour they were opening up for somebody just for an australian australian tour and yeah from there just I really enjoyed the whole the whole tour thing and so kind of kept you know kept doing that worked you know working for different bands that first band i worked for was called storm the sky yeah, but then of... you've worked for some really big bands since then do you want to run through a little list it's time to brag sean okay um yeah so i did did a couple years working for the amity affliction i've been doing a bunch of i do like production managing and front of house for mall rat and tour manager and front of house for all day and then i've done front of house and monitors for a u.s band called census fail and another one called the plot new um so predominantly metal but do i've been definitely i feel like the last year and a half too has predominantly been the pop rap kind of thing um yeah i was at ginger i did assisted for a session for justin bieber which was pretty fun nice. but that's kind of the i don't know the, the list of it i guess and I that's think getting... significant that's pretty significant justin's yeah, it's nothing to be sneezed at you, you you mentioned before that the, the front of house guy didn't turn up yeah and, and you know and and you also said you did a pretty crappy job it can't have been that bad if you ended up doing the bands that you've ended up doing front of house I had so we had the opportunity presented itself, you know, and you said yes. How important is that? Oh, I think it's I think it's really important. I think with with that particular case, it wasn't, you know, I knew how to mix, it was just a particular desk I wasn't familiar with. So we had luckily they had two shows. So I went home and just, you know, spent a bit of time getting more familiar. And then the second night went pretty well. But yeah, I think it's like you definitely need to know what you're doing to a certain extent, but there's also a certain amount of time where you've got to, you know, jump a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Like just, you know, I'm always hesitant with live sound is because you don't, you've got to, you can't ruin a band's show. You know what I mean? Like you've got yeah. to know enough that you're going to go okay. However, it's always going to be daunting at the start. You know, it's always going to be, you know, a bit scary. And I think you've just got to do it maybe even before maybe quite a little bit before you think you're ready to do it. Yep. Everything yeah. that's good is hard. Is that, would that be a fair thing? And uh, Audrey, if we came back around to you, it would be that you've started, I'm going to be a trumpet player, a jazz trumpet player. That's the course you've enrolled in. You've taken on vocals. That's a huge jump from I'm going to play in the, the trumpet trio or whatever or in a jazz band. But it's, yeah. it's a significant jump. And then also to take on the role of manager or manage, you know, managing artist managing for yourself um, there's a lot of skills that you've added to that. All of those must have been jumps for you. Uh, yeah, they definitely were. I think it all came from ambition, to be honest. Right. Uh, just wanting my own projects to succeed and being frustrated sometimes by uh, the results or how it was being done. And also wanting, like, like a sort of... I wanted to sing because I wanted to be <laughs> more of a front person. And uh, uh, I guess I started learning about some music production stuff and producing my own records and doing co-production with friends because I wanted more control over the um, the end product. And I think uh, there's a weird, like this is a bit of a sidestep, but there's like this weird kind of trope of um, artists particularly female singers, um, not being in control or not being asked to contribute to the production of their own records. And I experienced a little bit of that and wasn't into it at all, into people telling me what my music should be. So I really started learning those skills 
and management was the same you know i wanted to be making the decisions about where where i wanted my music to be placed and those sorts of things or so yeah i think it it came from ambition and like wanting creative control was a big part of it okay what is is it was there moments of doubt in all of that like this is something i this is just too, too <laughs> big this is too high i can't jump over this uh yeah basically every day <laughs> <laughs> but there's always like uh it's such a you know it, it's it's especially like this year of of all years like it's such a hard thing and i just keep thinking about it right now it's so hard but when i think about what i got to do before this year before covid it i had the best life you know it the highs it, it's really hard and it does feel like too much and you give so much of yourself to this industry but you get a lot in return and it, when it's great it's really great the yeah. wins are big wins and you get it's a really good community as well and there's a community all around the world of music people that you can always be a part of so it's definitely worth it i think <laughs> well, um, we've been at we've been joined by peter satchel hi pete how are you doing Lovely to have you along. Lovely to have you along. Um, hey, sure. How are you? Haven't seen good. you in a while. I know. How are you, Pete? Pretty good, mate. Good to see awesome. you. Awesome. Likewise. Thanks. Just back to you, Audrey. I've just got a, 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 had a phone call from the Prime Minister. He says we'll be out of this by 2022, 20, and um, all things will be back to normal. 2022. So like, yeah, yeah. That's not so long as far ago. It's, it's, it's coming soon. He's just forgotten to buy the medicine, but it's on its way. Sean, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm sorry, okay. Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, um, we, I think one of the things that, that, that Audrey's just touched on is sort of resilience. And you've been a guy who's been in the industry for a while and, um, and continues to play. Time. Yeah, not as long as me, I understand. But, but um, <laughs> what would you say on that? How hard is that? I mean, we're, it is an industry where you, you're taking giant leaps. And you and I had a recent conversation about your band, um, Dallas Crane, and, and, and whether the decisions that need to be made now are the decisions that you should be making or you should be getting somebody else in to do. Um, can you take us through a bit of that kind of process? And also you were signed to a significant label, a significant label which was Albert's, um, where ACDC was signed, a whole bunch of other people were signed, um, where I suppose some decisions were made for you. And, and I'm forgetting the question the longer I talk, but I think what I'm talking about is What's it like? You know, the, do you have to build up a resilience to those for those hard moments? Because not everything is a win, as Audrey's pointed out. Yeah, I'd, it it'd be um, very difficult being a band just starting out right now and trying to do live gigs because they're non-existent, right? And we've had um, shows pulled out from under our, well, not from under, you know, like we've had cancellations from um, Tasmania. Uh, um a couple in new south wales and we've got some far north queensland things happening that i hope happen and that's more for holiday reasons as well as playing of course um but it's pretty difficult at the moment to do that um as far as who makes decisions they're getting made for us at you know right now um we've got a corner gig with Dom's band and on the 23rd of uh, next month. So that's coming up pretty quickly and I'm not too sure if that'll go ahead. You know, it's pretty hard to promote even on that regard because people are um, really trepidatious of buying tickets or, you know, like um, even wanting to sort of go out. But we're fiercely independent, Paul. We have been for a while on, on the decisions. We... Um, have made some bad decisions to be work out that we have to be fiercely independent um, because there was we had some management problems back in back in the day that we kind of looked in hindsight and said we could have we could have done that better and that if any advice um to you know young young bands and young musicians is um, when you choose a man management deal it's kind of like all fine and well to feel um really special as you painted and same with record labels same with alberts um but at the end of the day they're out to make money as well and if you think that you're able to that you've got a um and with production with choosing producers with everything uh you've got to really think that through and i guess a band can't be a democracy because someone else has to make someone has to make a final decision and if you get trapped into that whole democracy thing then you're neither here or there 
and you will have a leader and you kind of have to have faith in the person who you, you know, um, or who shows the most business now or whatnot and has to be a leader. But it is... I, it's, I, I agree with that. I, I, I'm not sure no. that I've been, you know... I've spent most of my time as a, a sort of a guitar player for hire. And if you want to talk about gigs cancelled, I've just had the grand final. The AFL grand oh, final man. twice, last year and this year. So don't start complaining about gigs, mate. And because uh, that was a nice little payday for all of us. But um, uh, it's, uh, yeah. it, it is a thing. I'm not sure that democracy really works in this art artistic conquest. And particularly if we're talking about artistic management or we're talking about setting up Art, um, sorry, artistic pursuit or artistic management or record companies or publishing companies. I, I, say, I tend to agree with you. I'm not sure. I think you need a decision maker at the end. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Otherwise, people sit around going, oh, but what if, or what do you think, or what? You need someone to go, hey, we're doing this at the end of the day, seriously. I've, it's one thing I'm out of 20. Five thirty years, and yep. yeah, oh God, yeah, about that. Um, in the industry, is um, what I have learned. You need someone to make decisions, and you can take it to a certain point. But if it gets stymied or stonewalled, then you need someone to take it, carry it over the line, and um, and otherwise you flounder. And I promise you, I, that's one thing I really know. And I've known through every band who I've ever witnessed. You know, from. Look at the Beatles, for God's sake. So they started as a democracy and look how they ended. You yeah, know? Yeah. Dom, how does it work for you, there's two of you? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, good question. I think we like to say that Nick, my friend, is very much the storm and I am very much the calm. So I feel like I make a lot of the decisions. Um, uh, but we're definitely col like, yeah, we collab on everything. So, but yeah, I think that does definitely has to be one person that says, you know, presents the idea and the pathway and then we just agree to it. Um, but I feel like if you know, if you're in a band, you're with hopefully people that you really love and that you would have similar kind of viewpoints or pathways that you want to go in. I mean, maybe different if you were in a huge, huge band and you really had like some outlying people. But at my level, I think um, I always am with similar minded people, I guess. It doesn't make it very hard to make decisions like that. Okay. Sean, you've observed a lot of bands and some very successful ones, and yep. you've observed individuals like all day. Um, yep. Which sort of system do you think works, works best, or, or, or are they all fraught with the same kinds of issues? Um, bands are. <laughs> Solo artists aren't. But, yeah, I definitely agree with what Pete was saying before in terms of, like, the bands I've seen do best is either art leader or there's there's two people kind of making the decisions, you know, there's someone who's really careful and someone who's a bit more like all, all the bands I've seen do well have either had, you know, one person or one person and kind of their go-to making all the decisions. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah, no, I'm, so, I'm, I'm wondering because, because as a front of house person, it's either sort of, or, or a number of the roles that you've played, you yep. must have observed some fairly hectic, um, and um, <laughs> yeah. some fairly robust discussions amongst the bands. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's um, yeah, I think, but I think it's also important, for, like particularly in those tour situations, having a strong tour manager or something like that, sometimes to kind of arbitrate a lot of stuff that's happening. You know, because particularly when you, you're on tour, it's not just about you know technical stuff or just about band stuff it's about interpersonal stuff as well like you know you're essentially living with each other for you know five six months a year so there's a lot of stuff that comes with that so i think having a strong tour manager is really really helpful for those yep. things yep. hey sean can i ask a question yep um so in the vocational world i'm trying to invent um or try and design some courses that cater for everything Yep. that you can actually have a vocation in the music industry. And a lot of people do TMing, right? Yeah. Um, 
is it worth looking at a stream like that to educate on TMing? And if I did, would you be willing to jump on board as a teacher? Yeah, I, I reckon it would be, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a really good one because I reckon it's one that's, it's a job that's not certainly, no one really talks about it all that much. And I think no. the only way you can learn how to do it is if you, like the only way I learned how to manage was being on tours with other good tour managers and bad tour managers. So I had to learn from either their mistakes. And I think a lot of other people too, they've either learned the same way or if they've learned the only way you can do it is just by doing lots of tours and not doing it so well. Because particularly being good tour manager, it's just about, it's about a thousand little things rather than five big things. You know, all the, you know, all the main stuff is easy. It's the little things that make the difference between a tour being awesome and a tour being awful, you know? Completely, completely. But I think it's really valid in having that as an option if you want to get in the industry too, right? Yeah, for sure. Like the, I think, and a lot of the time it is um, um, FOH and slash TMing as well, you know? Yeah, that's it. I reckon it's a big, like, for me, I I prefer to do just one of the other or uh, the, the other when I can. But often until working for a band that's got a really big budget, they always need to combine someone, whether it's the TM front of house, TM monitors, or TM lighting. So I think if you're any of those positions, or even if you're doing a guitar tech or whatever, being a tour manager just gives you a cut above. E to be honest, even if you're a player, like I found a lot of session guys get their work from being a session player and just being on tour and as the TM and then guitarists can't turn up or whatever, and then they become the set, or vice versa. You know, you're always going to get hired if you've, you can off, offer two roles where someone else can only offer one. Definitely. Which is an interesting sure. thing because all of you have talked about, and we'll get to you, Marlon, in a second, but, but from Audrey to Don to Pete to Sean, you've all talked about dual duties here. You've all talked about dual responsibilities and developing other responsibilities that have kept you in a gig or yep. helped the gig that you're doing. Um, Marlon, I'm imagining composing is a fairly lonely job. But you've composed with another guy, and so that's been part of it. And and you have – how does it work? How do you get a job? How does that work? How does it develop itself? And at what point did you start feeling comfortable enough to do it? You, you know, go, yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, I mean, first up, I'm still not comfortable saying I can do that. That's still I, – and I think that's one thing that I've learned from a lot of different people is that the, the imposter syndrome kind of doesn't go away. You just kind of have to deal with it. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, I, I guess going about getting jobs for me has been interesting. I think the main thing that I think I did well, I'm not 100% sure yet because I'm still in the early stages of my career, but I think just making friends first and um, making sort of network connections second has been really uh, a positive thing for me because, I've, I've one, I've made lots of friends, which is always a great thing. And two, I like the people that I work with. I, you know, I'm friends with. They they are collaborators because a lot of the time I'm working with people who aren't musicians, who are a director or a producer or someone who, you know, might just want some music for their brand. A lot of the time I'm translating between musical stuff and non-musical stuff. So having those interpersonal skills, um, I think, has been really, really like a, a great you know tool in my belt. To be able to, to so work how would you people. define those interpersonal skills that you're 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 uh, you're you're got people coming to you going I want the music to be this 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 and this and yeah. then you might draw get your grayscale sketch of what you think that music is and play it to them they go oh no that's completely wrong that's not what I had in mind it's like well hang on that's how yeah. you described it so yeah you know, I mean but I, that's that I mean that happened I I, I was hired for my first. Uh, feature film and it was a really big deal for me because I you know it was it was a fair amount of money for me it was a big deal and the the per, the, the director who pitched it um, gave me this brief and I was like great I can do that um, and two weeks before the film uh, was due to be finished I got fired um, and that was just a massive setback for me it was a real big deal but honestly from that I learned okay this person was describing it in this way and I didn't understand what he was saying. And that's the reason I lost the job. Um, and so I sort of had to really learn how to um, translate things that people are saying and, and almost sort of doing a little bit of, sort of psychology detective work of, of 
thinking about how, what they're saying and what they actually mean rather than what they're saying on, on a surface level. So that's somebody saying no to you yeah. when, you're, when you're going full ahead at something that you think you've got right. Yeah. Yes, that's going to cause a fair amount of emotional stress on yeah. anybody and strain on anybody. So I guess there's a resilience le- lesson to be learned out of that. But, but, but what you're just describing more than that. You're just describing what it's taught you, what you learned out of that process. Mm. What do you think? Is there a takeaway from, from all of that for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, resilience is just such a, it's, it's a really pretty big thing. But I think for me, uh, it was also like outside of all, this, all of the music, all of the tech, all of, all of those skills, was just being able to step away from it and look after myself mentally after that because you know it was such a big i spent six months working on it um wow. and like it it got to the end and i sort of didn't have anything to show for it but being able to sort of say to myself look that didn't go well here's what didn't go well um let's pick myself up and sort of and, and get on with it and i've gone on to do so much much better music and much better work um just because i sort of learned from the, the communication and that sort of stuff from that, that you and this is a question directed at all of you. Um, how important is it to set a goal? Because, I mean, here we are sitting at the stage. Um, Pete's mentioned the, the issues pertaining to, you know, I don't know if my gig on the 23rd is going to, and incidentally, Pete, the grand final was on the 25th, but we won't go back there. Um, <clears throat> how important is it to set a goal that's manageable so that you're not going, hey, Audrey, I'm going to be number one on the charts or Dom, NYCK is going to be number one on the charts. You know, you're... You're in a very highly volatile, very commercialised system. Um, uh, perhaps the most, the, the most commercialised. Um, uh, perhaps the most commercialised industry in the world. How important is it to set goals? Um, can I answer this one? Please. Yeah, anyone mind? Someone once yep. told me to set five-year goals, and it was the best thing that I ever done. And realised that to get to like it's like the ladder, the ladder you climb. And to get to the certain rung that I wanted to get to, I needed to get to rung two and three first. And that was put in my five years um, and my five-year plan. And I kind of, you know, didn't listen to it as much when I was younger, but it really is the most sound advice that I've ever had. It said, if you want to get here, you have to do this and that to get to that point first. Like dream big, of course, but in a reality, in a realistic world, um, And I did, and I checked off those goals and said, all right, okay, to become a teacher, for example, I need to do a TAE, first of all, you know. And so I did that. And um, then it's, okay, from here, I need to still have the industry because I want people, I want the authenticity. And I also want um, to be able to, you know, like actually be comfortable with what I'm doing. So, you know, I did a couple of guitar lessons and then I took on, you know, came to Box Hill or a couple of other institutes and took on classes. And that was all to my five-year goal was to end up being in a teacher. It really, really was. And I think they're invaluable is to set goals because we dream big and dream hard and there's nothing wrong with doing that. And some people get it. It's kind of like the lottery. But the reality for most of us um, is that setting a goal and having an objective that is obtainable um, works. It, it, you know, like I can really, really vouch that it did for me. And I'm sure you'd probably be the same, maybe, I reckon, or Dom, you know? Yeah, I, I, I um, can't agree. I, reckon I the was goals just going to say with the goals, like I agree with everything Pete said, uh, especially about having a realistic goal. <laughs> like, But uh, the other thing I just thought of, listening to that is it's like uh, something that happens in the music industry is you sort of have this preconceived idea of what success is, you know, and a lot of the times the people that appear to be really successful might not be or it might be short-lived or whatever and your particular version of success is going to be different to everyone else's and I think the mistakes that I made when I was younger, like one thing for me, a really specific example that people might be able to relate to. I was obsessed with the idea of getting my first band onto Triple J. We got on Triple J and like we were put on rotation, nothing happened. Like it it was not success, you know, it was, but I was so obsessed with achieving that goal and I achieved it. 
but uh, I think there's this idea of when you have these preconceived notions of success, then you you shut out all these other opportunities. And particularly if you're releasing your own music, you don't know where that's going to find a home. And you have to be open to wherever, you know, open to other avenues instead of trying to force it like a square peg into a round hole. You know, I make sort of like jazzy music. That was never really going to fly with Triple J anyway, but and I wasted so much time trying to fit it in, and I realized that it was somewhat it was an external idea of the success of that music was rather than actually finding the people that would listen to it and finding an audience that will listen to it long term, not just while it's cool. Um, some people are cool forever, which is awesome. <laughs> But yeah, I think uh, like uh, even like all the analytics on uh, Facebook and Instagram advertising is based around that finding an audience that is most likely to engage with your output and engage with it long term. And and I guess on that line, you talked about you got accepted at Triple J, and that really wasn't what you what it wasn't the right thing. Imagine if you had got accepted at Fox. <laughs> You know, and you're you're on a hot rotation. <laughs> well, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way because it's a viable, it's a great radio station. Not mine, but it's a great radio station. But for a band like NYCK, that could be the death knell. Don, do you know what I mean? In terms of of what's going on, everybody wants success. No one's going to yeah. you know knock back a, a platinum record. However, what would it mean for you? It's completely taken out of your hands, as Audrey says. But if you release something, who knows who adds it. Yeah. Oh, go, Sean. You go. Oh, I was just going to say on the goals thing. I think the goals, setting goals and five year goals too, is is really important because it gives you, um, for me, it it gives you know like we're talking about the imposter syndrome thing and measuring success. Like it's success in the music industry is so arbitrary. It's not like, you know, you get you not just one day you're up front a house guy. You're at so and so, you know, company or whatever. I feel like. Having that those goals, it it helps battle that imposter syndrome because you know if you set yourself at this point, whether it's a you want a, an income goal or a place goal or a band goal, when you reach it, you can kind of tell yourself, force yourself to be like, okay, I am successful or I am, my abilities are worthy or whatever it is, and you kind of lose that a little bit. And I and I also think for me to like having goals at the start it it meant that when nothing was necessarily happening i still was trying to do something you know if i didn't have shows on or if i didn't you know my bands didn't have gigs or whatever it makes you get up and still work towards stuff because it, you're kind of creating the itinerary i guess mm -hmm. yeah. how do you measure your success dom that's that, that's really good sean in, in fact fantastic to hear that and and that you would always have something irrespective in terms of you, Dom, is it is it about the next release, and if that doesn't get added, or because that can be that that can be a terrible thing. I've managed bands where they've worked for a year on an album, it doesn't get picked up by Triple J, which means they don't get certain festivals, which means the next twelve months is is kind of lost, and 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 a significant amount of time as money as well as time has been invested. How do you look at set goals? Um, yeah, and I've definitely been there with same as Audrey, like thinking that one thing is the best thing and then kind of, you know, it, once you achieve it or if you don't achieve it, like, meh, whatever, let's just move on. But I think um, it is, I don't, I don't know if I'm much of a goal setter myself. I think um, maybe subconsciously I am like, oh, I'd love to be able to play that venue or I'd love to be able to work with that producer but I've never explicitly said to myself, I have to do this. Um, maybe more so in the world of like releasing records. Yep, cool, release EP, album, another EP on its way and another one. So I guess in that way, yeah, but I think goal setting can also be, um, it can kind of be disappointing in some ways and especially the kind of world that we're living in right now, it can be really hard to set those big goals and be satisfied with them. Like I know, Pete, for you, you were you were going to play with KISS, supporting KISS, what's well, been like two years now and it keeps getting pushed back. So 
I think it's like that. Really COVID. That'll happen. Gene Simmons will die of COVID just as well. <laughs> yeah, it'll never happen. Um, but I think subconscious goals are really um, strong as well, and things that we don't really notice that we that we want to achieve, especially in this industry. Um, five years seems like a long time for a goal, in, particularly in the mm. contemporary industry. Mm. It seems like a long time. Maybe because I'm the oldest man on the screen, um, but five years does seem like a long time. Marlon, in your world, can you set a goal? Or are you completely at the whim of the phone ringing um, and somebody saying, hey, we've got a gig for you? Yeah, I mean, totally. I mean, you've you, you still got to be the master of your, of your own destiny. You can't sort of sit on your laurels and wait for some jobs to come in. Um, yeah, I mean, there's 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 always stuff for you to be doing, and I think it, I I don't know because I'm I'm not a performing musician, but for me there is literally always something to be doing, whether it's you know writing for your own sort of stuff, writing more demo reels, working on your website. There's always stuff to be working on. So I actually find um, I probably should be setting five year goals, but I've been setting myself sort of small goals, especially in lockdown, um, where being creative is sometimes really hard. I've been setting myself sort of goals of write a track today or just clean the studio today or, you know, it doesn't always have to revolve around outputting music, but as long as you're giving yourself like, it's like a like a, a production present, you know, for the future. You're, you're doing something that will help you in the future, even if it's not creative, um, that will, yeah, it, like it's sort of, sort of a goal, sort of like a thing just to be doing while you're not doing anything, but yeah. Okay. That's that's helped me recently, especially. No, I think that's really interesting, and I think that's really important that you don't make it always about musical output. Yeah. Um, Pete, if I come yeah. back to you, and I and I talk about Dallas Crane in the early days, and you say it's twenty five years ago. I say, well, you know, but it's you say it's twenty five years ago. Um, what was it like then? It was it just you know four blokes getting together, going, we all like rock and roll, and here's my three three five, and I'm going to turn up my. Yeah, all right, Paul. Cool. Come on, we can. I think we might have even talked like this. There was, when I was starting out, there wasn't um, even email. Yeah, we right. had a friend who worked at Australia Post, and we used to do a gig and we'd build up our fan base by people filling out kind of like if you didn't have a phone to do a QR code, you'd put your name down and your phone number down. And um, we would take numbers down and we were lucky enough to avoid postage because we had a friend who worked at Aussie Post and we would get it out there and in fact one of my favourite stories of that time was our first Esplanade Hotel gig and um, Trish Shoesmith um, had double booked us and we um, so it got blown out on us because it was our first one and anyways um, and we went through the white pages looking at our mailing list and ringing each Home, landline, home, family line to um, say that we're actually having a party instead. And, you know, you'd cop someone's mum and it'd be like, oh, hey, how you doing? Mrs. <laughs> so it's, you know, Can you explain so, what, the wide pages, what the wide pages is for those yeah, people? Phone directory back in the day. And that was the reality. But it was also putting, and you can still do this, um, is, you know, like self-promotion. It didn't have the means of online, but you went out and you hit intersections with street poles and you'd put posters up and and things like that and um it felt a lot more honest in a way you know and i often talk to this about my students you've got the means to do a video clip with your phone you've got the software in your computer you can write a song and add drums to it straight away and whatnot and you can get it out there and if it works it can go viral kind of thing i get i really appreciate that and with a lot of it great music gets heard there's also a lot of mediocre that gets put out there because of that too but um paul starting out like that in answer to your question it was just the yards you did and you worked from you know oh to, okay so a milestone might have been the um the sp and then you got to the corner or something like that and then you got on your first you know tour that was taking you into state and you drive up the hume and and whatnot, and and another thing is, we always contacted bands who we always who we wanted to play with, and we said, hey, we really want to play with you. Here's our demos. Like, would you have us on board? You know, and I still think that's really valuable. And I still tell that to um students. I'm like, well, choose an artist you want to get out there. Just who do you really admire, and who do you think an audience that would like yours 
as well and just hit them up and people are really um i mean being here you know like um Marlon, sean dom matt if someone sends you a demo and says i really like your band and i'd love to play with you you kind of go oh you know like and you kind of look for a spot for it to happen too you know um I Absolutely. I think it's a great thing. I was talking to Matt Tanner, who's a creative services manager at um, Native Tongue the other day, and a mate of, of Matt Voyager, who was going to come to in a second, and um, Matt was saying what he gets in terms of trying to set up collaborate, collaborations with other writers is he gets his bands to go directly to the bands as opposed to trying to go through the management. And the chances that he might upset the management are far outweighed by the success he has in the bands that actually end up making that collaboration. So I think that's an important thing. And I think people are actually really, um, they're, they're kind of like, wow, you really like my band? That's great. You love what I'm doing. This is, you know, I think that's a much better way of doing it. Um, Matt, I am going to come to you because you've been sitting up there the whole time at the top of my screen. You are the man who's uh, made so many of the full move records that we've listened to. Tell me about your story. I'm sorry it's taken this long to get there. We've lost Audrey. She's lost internet. Yeah, she's just lost her internet connection. Yeah. Um, yeah. I uh, started many, many years ago, um, and I don't want to take up too much time because it's 4.55. So, um, and it was, I didn't, I played in bands and didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to have a career in music. And I was just passionate about that. So I figured I could live with myself if I have a career in music. And so, um, I went. I, I had actually a job selling sandwiches, and I'd go around to all these different businesses and sold sandwiches and cakes and a little cash job on the side. Um, and uh, one of the places I went to was a recording studio, and so they got to know me over six months. And you know, oh, he's all right, you know. Um, and I said, oh, I'd love to do work experience. So I got some work experience there, and then my auntie had a connection at Metropolis Studios, and. Oh, can I do some work experience there? So I, I got in there and did a week's work experience. And then I went back to this other studio, RBX, and oh, can I have another week's work experience? And I think I was just really determined and knew nothing, knew nothing, but blindly determined and, and wasn't fussed if someone told me no and I'd keep going, keep going. Yep. Um, and eventually I got an opportunity. I said, all right, come on, you know, you seem all right. We'll give you a chance. We'll, we'll hire you for three months and see how it goes. Um, and that's where it went. And so then from there, I just, you know, you, you took, take opportunities, you do your best to learn. Um, I loved what you said, Sean, about doing things before you think you're ready completely. Like I, I've been doing that just all my life. Um, and it's just, a, it's just about walking through doors and having a go. Um, so highly recommend it. And then, yeah, follow your passion um, and, and work hard at it. You're always learning. Um, I'd, you know, it's been great hearing from everyone. I'd be interested to know, like, when you finished your study, um, how many other things you had to learn um, post post your education to sort of to keep yourself going and, and getting cash flow. And Sean, um, we'll start with you. Yeah, please. I uh, yeah, I feel like I feel like you got to you got to keep learning constantly. Like, um. I think particularly in the beginning, like to maintain a source of income. So let me go back a step. So I think a big thing about getting a career in music industry is being available. And so to be available, you've got to make sure you don't have another job or something that you're like, oh, I can't, I can't mix your gig because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working the, the cafe Friday night or whatever. Like not to say there's anything wrong with those things but i think if you can diversify your skills to be making money off music early even if it means you're recording someone and playing guitar for that guy and mixing that guy or whatever i think that's important just so it allows you to have to be available to get the gig that's going to be the one that's going to you know make you your main money or make you your job i guess <laughs> that makes sense no it does sean it does and it becomes a defining point when you know that if you want to start a family or something and if you're um at that stage and it might take years it took me to you know band got me through um financially i've always earned something to do with music right um ever since i left high school and they came to a point where um it was like you know i've got two kids and a mortgage and so um 
I gave up dreams of saying I can drop everything and go on a tour for six months yep. internationally or something like that. And we're at the fortunate point where we can pick and choose gigs. But before that, you were completely correct. You have to dedicate everything to it and say, you know, we've got this show's come up and it might be so and so. And you go, yep, I'm doing it. We're going to do it. And then, and then by then, it's not, it's, it's almost a subconscious decision that. You know, like you're all at a certain age, you're all at 35 or 40 or getting near there yeah. and you go, hey, you know, we've got to scale back and this is my priority now. And generally, um, everyone else is feeling like that too because you played in a band with them for ages and, you know, everyone gets it kind of thing. You know? Yeah. But it, definitely what you said is right. You know, you have to prioritise it. That's what you want to do. And, and a Friday night cafe gig or pour and beer or whatever might be a means to the end for you to earn some money to subsidise your career. But... If it means that you can't go to Sydney or you can't go to wherever it might be, you don't do that Friday night gig. You go on the band, you know, you go with your yeah, band. Totally. Or you can sell sandwiches at Lamingtons and end up mixing a Powderfinger record. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's uh, I'm, I'm going to get you to brag because it is hit, hit five o'clock. How many up records did you make while you were working in Sydney, mate? Uh, gee, 25 years worth. Um, okay. A few, a few. <laughs> some, of, some of the names that you can leave us with uh, that came. Oh, out you don't need to hear names. It's not. A I've been looking at your uh, discog while I've been sitting here, Matt, and it's oh, really? insane. Oh, yeah. no, is it? Yeah. That's nice, thanks, Sean. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. We, uh, we, are, we, we do have to finish, and we could go on for a long time. And you guys have been fantastic in, in what you've offered and contributed. So I just want to thank you. But can I also ask you just? one last definitive comment that you would say that's kept you going or that you would offer to the students? And I'll start with you, Marlon, please. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I guess just like I said before, just make friends with people. You know, the, the music industry is about the people you meet um, and the connections you make. So, you know, be friendly to people. <laughs> okay. Pete? Um, sorry, Paul, I just said a question in there from Jackie but what was what was it uh, um, it, 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 it was what last piece of advice would you leave for students what last piece of advice would I leave for students okay you get you feel me because you want to study music you get um, goosebumps and you you know like can tear up to it and all that sort of stuff it messes you on other levels that it does with other people and follow your heart and only you'll know when it's something might happen where you have to um you know take your sidetrack from it but you're doing the right thing by following your heart and go with it i mean like music makes the world go around it makes you happy it makes it you know everyone happy seriously go with it it's audrey cool. you dropped out for a second but we're, we're we're finishing up and um uh not you you're not finishing up you're just getting started but i'm going to ask you this question and that is what last piece of advice glaring piece of advice will you give to students based on your experience she's gone to mute audrey's I suspected she was a robot. I think it's true. Audrey, can you hear me? Dom, I'm going to go to yeah. you. I'm going to go. I'm going to. I'm going to go to you. Sorry, Audrey. my internet's doing crappy too. Um, a piece of advice. Um, I would just say that you need to say yes to everything. Every experience is great. Um, imposter syndrome is definitely a thing, but it takes you. The amount of times to say yes, it helps every single time. So I think that's a really important thing to think about. Okay. And say yes when you're busy? Yeah. I, I reckon you that. work the best when you're busy. Yep, me too. You put under pressure. Yep. Good. Yep. Yep. Give the job to a busy person. Audrey, yep. are you with us? Are you locked in there or in another time dimension? <sighs> It's all a bit Doctor Who. I'm going to go over to Sean Fuller over here. And um, Sean, last piece of advice, and also as an Xbox Hill student, I suppose. Um, would you um, my, mine's two things. I feel like it's more yeah. personal ones. I feel like the first one is, obviously, it depends on your friends and family and the people you have around you. But I feel like when I started, a lot of people almost didn't treat music like a real career, you know, because it's fun. You know, it's an enjoyable thing and it's incredibly competitive. Like, it 
there's no denying it's incredibly competitive. So I think you've got it when you decide to do it. If people, you know, tell you it's not viable or blah, 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 you've got to ignore them because it, it 100% is, you know, it's a huge industry. A lot of people, it's competitive, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. And I think in the, I second the thing, the second thing I think is a personal one and that you've got to give yourself time to make it happen. You know, I, I've seen so many great performers or great engineers who would have had a fantastic career stop because it didn't happen in six months or 12 months. So I, I think you've got to give yourself time, ignore the regular, you know, societal rungs of success, I get guess. And then if you stick with it, you know, you're going to find something, you're going to find a career in it somehow, as long as you persist with it. Are you saying persistence, which I think is a really important thing? Yeah. Yeah. You're also saying learning. Uh, and that's big. Yep. Audrey came up with ambition before. You know, she was in, she's incredibly ambitious. Um, we've also talked about, you know, learning something about resilience and, and dealing with no as an answer. Um, but all of you have also exhibited the fact that you've got one or two skills. I don't care whether it's making sandwiches and mixing records um, mm. or whatever it may be, but all of you have got a number of skills around the thing that it is that, it is that you love doing most. Sean Mules is, mo is most evident perhaps because you have, uh, you, know, you worked in a lot of sides of tech and, and you're a musician, you know, yeah. and um, I worked in, as a musician, but I was a manager. And um, yep. you're, you're an educator, you're also a musician. Dom, you've got an active record contract, you're a musician. Marlon, you know, you're a musician, you're a bass player, there's a whole bunch of other things, that, and you're a composer. Um, it seems to be that the additional things are some way, sometimes the gateways into the success that we have. Would people agree with that? Yeah. Definitely. We have to say goodbye. It's 555, so I'm handing over to you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, everyone, so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope you've got something out of it. Um, I think there's a few contact, uh, contacts that have been happening in the chat, so if anyone wishes to call us, contact us, you can look at that or uh, just go to the website, uh, Box Hill Institute. So thanks, Sean, Marlon, Pete, Tom. Oh, um, thanks, Paul, yeah. and thank you for Audrey, who's dropped out because of some internet issues. Um, great stuff. Um, all the best, and, and see you around town, maybe when we're out of lockdown. Here's Audrey coming back now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, You're Audrey. Back for the wave, Audrey. <laughs> thanks <laughs> heaps. See you, guys. And um, anyone who I put my contacts in the chat to, please um, contact me. And I'll be able to... I'll contact you. I'll contact you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> hey, hey, Shauna, get, good to see you again, mate. Yeah, you too, mate. You too. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. How do you? See ya. Bye.